Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. This week, we present another episode from our listener library, featuring suggestions from you, our mysterious listeners. Scott writes, love the podcast, listen to it all the time, even talk my wife and teenage sons into listening and enjoying the show and we're on the road. Couple of suggestions. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. I think this was the Molay Mystery Theater. Peter Laurie was the host. It's a fantastic version of the Robert Block short story. Scott goes on to suggest a few more shows, but... We're going to put those in the listener library for another episode. You're right, Scott. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper, is from Mole Mystery Theater. But it's a little more complicated than that. The surviving version of Yours Truly, Jack the Ripper is from a show called Mystery Playhouse, created in 1944 by the American Forces Network for the express purpose of entertaining our boys overseas. The show was hosted by Peter Laurie and featured rebroadcast stories from other popular mystery and suspense shows of the day, including The Whistler, Inner Sanctum, Mr. and Mrs. North, and in the case of yours truly, Jack the Ripper, Mole Mystery Theater. Mole Mystery Theater premiered on NBC in 1943 as Mystery Theater, eventually gaining a sponsor and a new name in the form of Mole Brand Shaving Cream. It promised adaptations of the best in mystery and detective fiction from classic to contemporary. The show was narrated by a fictional amateur detective named Jeffrey Barnes, who filled in crucial exposition and helped the listener analyze the clues. In 1948, the show moved to CBS and dropped Mole, returning to the name Mystery Theater. Most old-time radio buffs consider the original NBC run to be the superior version. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper, is based on a short story by Robert Block, originally published in the July 1945 issue of Weird Tales. Today, Block is best known as the author of Psycho, the inspiration for Hitchcock's film classic of the same name. Over the course of his career, Block would return many times to the subject of Jack the Ripper, including a script for the original Star Trek series Wolf in the Fold. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker. Listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Two pairs of footsteps echoed down the dark alley. He stopped, waited, waited for Jack the Ripper to strike. But this is not London in 1888. No, this is Chicago in 1945. Yet Jack the Ripper is loose again to knife, to butcher his victims without trace. Creeps, this is Peter Laurie opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. If you recall, some 60 years ago, London was terrorized by a one-man crime wave, by a murderer who was never captured and never seen. And tonight, we follow the investigations of Sir Guy Hollis, who firmly believes that Jack the Ripper is still alive. That it is he who is the fiend that once again slashes and kills. There is the element of the supernatural in this story that will amaze you. For it seems that the spirit world has given the black heart of Jack the Ripper the power of everlasting life. <laughs> Time the present. Our scene is the reception room of a well-known Chicago psychiatrist, Dr. John Comedy. Miss Tannister, the doctor's assistant, is chatting with a tall, 
distinguished man who was apparently waiting to consult Dr. Comedy. But surely, Sir Guy, you can't believe a theory that seems so, well, uh, astrological. I'm afraid I do, Miss Kinnister. I will uh, grant, Miss Kinnister, that we still know very little about the life energy of the sun. About those forces which keep the planets in their sphere and keep a star from spinning astray and crashing into the regular building. Hello there. Oh, Dr. Carmody. I'll be with you in a moment, Mr. Hollis. Uh, Miss Canister, will you step into my office, please? Uh, take your time, Doctor. Anything to gain your patient's respect. Oh, well, what have I done now? It's Sir Guy Hollis. Oh. He's a lord or a knight or anyway, not a commoner. Attached to the British consulate here. Did you find out anything else about him? Nothing about his mental condition. He's right out of an English movie. Mm. Only thing that's missing is a monocle. Oh, yes, and he's a bug about astrology. Mm. Send him in, hmm? Mm-hmm. Doctor, will see you now, Thank you. It's been a somewhat busy day, Sir Guy. Sorry you had to wait so long. Well, an apology a doctor need never make, sir. Most attractive office, Doctor. It's also my home. Oh, that explains the piano, then, and the painting, mm-hmm. perhaps. Ah. Uh-huh. What do you think of London, Doctor? London? Why? Have you ever noticed anything strange about it? <laughs> The fog is famous, although here in Chicago we sometimes have one to match it. Yes, the fog. That's important. It always provides the perfect setting. For what? For murder. Murder. Tell me, Sir Guy, what is a Londoner doing in Chicago discussing murder with a psychiatrist? Have you ever heard of Jack the Ripper, Doctor? The murderer? The greatest monster of them all. Worse than Spring Hill Jack or Crippen, even. Red Jack. Red Jack the Ripper. Yes, I've heard of him. Do you know his history, Doctor? See here, Sir Guy. Doctors are pretty much in demand these days. I assumed you were a patient wanted my help as a psychiatrist. If you just wanted to swap old wives' tales about famous crimes, perhaps we might arrange dinner This is no old one. wives' tale, Doctor. This is a matter of life and death. Sorry. What is it? Well, listen. London, 1888. Out of nowhere, a shadowy figure with a knife haunting the squalid dives of... Whitechapel and Spitalfield. Six times that night descended into the throats and bodies of London's women. Thirty-nine stab wounds, the paper said the first time. August 31st, another victim. On September 8th, watchmen making their rounds in the grey dawn stumbled across the third hacked and horrid thing. Oh, I understand he used his knife rather well. He was an expert doctor. And where did he learn? At the operating table? The butcher's block? Some said on the police force. On November 9th, a sixth victim was found on the floor of her room. Panic in the grandstand? Yes, but needless panic. Months passed, a year. They said Jack had escaped to America. They said he committed suicide. They've been saying things ever since. You tell the story very well, but I'm afraid that's all the time I can give you today, Sir Guy. I haven't finished. I'm anxious to hear the rest of your Dr. story. Dr. I am on the trail of Jack the Ripper. I've tracked him here to Chicago. You've tracked... See here, Sir Guy. Oh, what was the date of those London murders? 1888. Well, if Jack the Ripper were even born that year, he'd be, uh, he'd be 56 today. I'd say Red Jack would be good and dead about now. Would he? Or should I say would she? Because the Ripper may have been a woman, you know. Do you think I'm insane, Doctor? No. Well, then you might listen to my reason for thinking the Ripper is still alive. I have been studying these cases for 13 years. Talked to officials, friends of the poor drabs he killed. And then I started studying unsolved murders all over the world. Followed a trail of blood. I could show you clippings from San Francisco, Shanghai, Berlin, Cairo, Milan. Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven such murders. And all had the trademark of the Ripper. Do you remember the uh, New Orleans torso slayings last summer? Well, vaguely. A colleague of mine tended the hearing. Then surely you remember two recent ones here in Chicago. One out on South Durban in September, and then a few weeks ago there was another very much like it up on Posted. Yeah. Well, Doctor? You're a criminologist. But, but figure it out, Sir Guy. If Red Jack were, say, 30 in 1888, he'd be 86 today. And no man of 86 could have butchered up that Halstead book. Suppose he didn't get any older. Suppose Red Jack 
knew how to stay young. But people do grow old, Sir Guy. Murderers, too. Whether they're women or butchers or scientists, they grow old. What about sorcerers? Who? Necromancers, wizards, practices of black magic. Now, see here, Doctor. I have studied the dates of those 87 murders, and they have an astrological significance. Suppose Red Jack didn't murder for murder's sake alone. Suppose he wanted to make a sacrifice. What kind of a sacrifice is that? It has been said that if you offer blood to the dark gods when the moon and the stars are right, they grant boons. Spoons of eternal youth. I don't understand, Sir Guy. I'm not an authority on witchcraft, nor even an amateur criminologist. Why have you come to me? Because Jack the Ripper is here in Chicago, and through you, I am going to capture him. Doctor. Uh, morning, Canister. Well, how did his lordship turn out last night? Hmm. He's the most exciting patient we've had in months. Uh, he's not a patient, Canister, at least not yet. Shouldn't he be? Oh, I can't tell. He talks so convincingly. Maybe there is a shred of reality in his story. It's real enough to him, Lord knows. Oh, excuse me, Doctor. Hmm? Dr. Carmody's office. Uh, may I speak with Dr. Carmody, please? It's most urgent. Uh, one moment. His lordship again. Oh, uh-huh. uh-huh. Hello? It's Guy Hollis, Doctor. Oh? Any new clues turn up overnight? You're willing to go through with it? Oh, just this minute sent my nurse out for a magnifying glass and a pair I of handcuffs. I don't think that'll be necessary, Doctor. Now, look here, Sir Guy. How can I possibly help you? I have good reason to believe the Ripper is among your acquaintances. What good reason? I'll tell you when I see you. I understand Lester Fenton, a friend of yours who writes a column for the Sun Herald, has invited you to a party tonight. Yes, that's right. How did you know that? I hope that you'll take me with you. Take you with me? I told you that I have plotted the astrological chart. The Ripper must make a sacrifice before this night passes. Oh. Okay. Uh, how about um, supper first? Splendid. Uh, pick me up at about 7.30. Thanks awfully, Doctor. All right. Bye. Are you sure you're doing the right thing? Well, that's why I wanted him to suffer first. If he proves dangerous, I'll manage to sidetrack him somehow. I hope Lester is in. Uh, I know. Hatchet murder on Polk Street. No, no murder yet, Lester. But if you don't become conscious, there may be. Oh, oh, John. Yes, that's right. Now, look, old man. Is it okay if I bring someone to the party tonight? Oh, sure, John. Well, like a... It's a guy... From the British consulate. Well, all the better. Manpower shortage and all that. Now, listen, Les. Uh, He's... Well, he's kind of a strange duck. I'm not sure yet whether his head is on right. That's okay. Uh, Plenty of company. See you tonight. Right. And after all that remains now is for Sir Guy and I to attend the party tonight and capture the Ripper. What are you talking about? Well, Sir Guy says the Ripper will be there tonight. You're joking. I am, yes. But Sir Guy isn't. And perhaps he's right. But I still don't know who you're hoping to find at Lester's party tonight, Sir Guy. A few writers, a painter, singer, all fairly normal. How about so is the Ripper? Perfectly normal, except on certain nights. Mm -hmm. Then he becomes an ageless, pathological monster crouching to kill. On evenings like tonight, when the stars are arranged in blazing patterns of death. But why among my friends? Because they are the kind of people the Ripper seeks out. But I warn you, Sir Guy, once these people find out what you're up to, you'd better be prepared for just about anything. I'll be ready. Look. What have you got there? See here, Sir Guy, you can't go around among my friends with a gun in your pocket. Oh. Then you keep it before me. Yeah. But be prepared to use it. Sure. Well, come on. The party should be in full swing by now. (laughs) 
Well, Sir Guy, are you enjoying yourself? Immensely, John. Your friends are very charming. Except that one of them is Jack the Ripper, huh? Perhaps. And if I get the opportunity, I think I'll show you how we can find out. Well, soon, I hope. It's one o'clock. I should be leaving. Leaving? Leaving? Who said leaving? Are you trying to slow my party, John? Oh, well, Lester, it is late. Don't I'm be re- a killjoy, John. I've hardly met our honored guest. Oh, dear. I... Are you here on a military mission, Sir Guy? Uh, not exactly. Well, then, if it's not secret... Could... Oh, not at all, Mr. Benton. I'm on the trail of Jack the Ripper. Jack... <laughs> Well, it's rude of us to be so curious. Sir Guy has an idea that Jack the Ripper is prowling around Chicago less, and he's out to find him. Oh, really? Uh, Sir Guy is serious. Well, he should be. According to some old files I've read, Red Jack was something of a menace. Had some uh, ripping good times. <laughs> oh, Les, your puns get worse daily. Oh, well, then I'll Sir bad. Guy is sure that the Ripper is responsible for the South Dearborn murder. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the one up on Halstead a few weeks ago. Uh, you've covered them, Les. What's your idea? Be very neat carving on both ends. But the oh, victims were yeah. men. I thought the Ripper was only interested in women. Oh, not at all. It's probably occurred to you that the uh, women we know the Ripper sought were fairly vivid symbols, a uh, kind of living comment on the society which he detested. Oh yes. And then just as our laws change and our society changes, so then must his victims change. Cut out the music. With each new age, the Ripper discovers a new symbol of protest. But tell us to God. Which do you hope to find here? The Ripper or the symbol? Yes, I'm rather curious about that. The Ripper. All right, boys and girls. We're trapped. Let's face it. Thank you, Les. I told you he was serious. I know, John, but what can you consider it? How still? Uh, I've got it. Uh, Laverne, let's have that bread knife there on the side, boy. Oh, Les. Thanks. Uh, Sir Guy has come a long way on a difficult mission, so let's give him a fair chance. I'll turn out the lights for one minute. And Sir Guy can stand here in the middle of the room with the bread knife. <laughs> now, if uh, anyone here is the Ripper, they can either make a break for it or take the opportunity to, uh, well, eradicate the pursuer. <laughs> That's fair enough, Sir Guy? Fair enough, Lester. Uh, Laverne, some uh, suitable background music, please. Uh, something Wagnerian, you know? Now, choose your partners for the kill, ladies and gentlemen. Every 60 seconds of darkness for evil to make its cosmic presence known. Unchallenged, unmolested, let the ripper ride. A minute for death, at the end of which we'll look for the bodies. Uh, ready? (laughs) All right, silence. Now, turn out the lights. Don't anyone move. Let the affirmative forces return. Let there be light. Ah! Look there on the floor. It's Sir Guy. My lord, he's been stabbed. Here, let's pick up the body and get it off. Look, I guess nobody had better touch the body. What is it? I mean... Well, doesn't Hollywood recommend the police in moments like this? For heaven's sake, Les. I swear, Les, I, I didn't want to bring him, but he insisted. He said he'd plotted the chart. He said he was certain the Ripper would use his knife before the night was out. I don't suppose we ought to move him, do you? What? Well, uh, I'll call the police. For heaven's sake, Les. Now look, if you have any ideas what we should do, Nigel, I'll shoot. Whoever goes to get the police could just as easily make a neat getaway. Lord, Les, if he was right... Not the Ripper. Uh, but I wasn't, Sam. Well, so hey, wait a minute. Look at that. Now, wait, I really idea, don't think that's I really quite the kind of a joke we should have had. Uh, please, um, uh, forgive me, Nadja, for uh, frightening you so. When you were all so innocent. Uh, what is a guy? What do you mean? Hold it. Hold it, everybody. Are you sure about our innocence, Sir Guy? Oh, yes. You see, if the Ripper were here, he would have betrayed himself when he saw me lying there. Not, not a very gentle spoof, I'm afraid. Oh, sure, Gentle, like a ton of bricks. Yeah, come on, let's get a drink. Let's get away from the comic. Well, John, uh, do we leave? It's getting rather late. Yes, Sir Guy. Oh, you can shut your mouth now, Nadia. The game's over. Oh, for heaven's sake. I'll get your coats. <laughs> Thanks. Well, goodbye, uh, everyone, and uh, forgive me if I gave you an unnecessary scare. Oh, they've forgotten about it already, Sir Guy. Good night, Les. 
Thanks. Don't mention it, John. Come around again, sir, guy. I'd like to. Good night, Lester. Good night. I suppose you're thinking that I'm guilty of the same sort of sensational tricks as our friend the Ripper, but... I want only to rid the world of a devilish fiend who lives by the blood of others. As Les said, they've all forgotten it by now. Well, I guess I was wrong to seek him out at a party. You know, we're far more likely to find him out here in the darkness and the fog. Perhaps along a lonely, shadowed street such as this. Or perhaps in a neglected dead end. Like this one here. Not so guy. Please, do me one more favor. You say it's only a hunch, but... Let's turn up this alley. See what it has to offer. Remember, the Ripper must make a sacrifice tonight. As long as I've gone this far. Thanks, man, boy. Yes, this is what the Ripper likes. Small, gaping alleyway. Hardly noticeable to the rest of the city. It'll be in a hidden corner like this where I'll capture him. And I'll turn the bloody swine over to the police. He's a mad beast, John. An ageless monster let loose on the world. There's nothing up here to die. No, just to the end of the alley, John. And we'll turn back, I promise. Look, Sir Guy, don't you think this is carrying a hobby a little too far? A hobby, John? In 1888, one of those nameless drabs the Ripper killed was my mother. Yes. My father spent his life searching for the Ripper. Caught up with him, too, about 1926 in Hollywood, where he was stabbed in a brawl. The police never learned who it was. But I know it was the Ripper. And I'll live till I find him. I swear I will. Let me have my gun now, John. We've left your friends, and I feel safer with my gun on me. I'll see here, Sir Guy. Oh, please, John. Now, let me carry the gun. Now, let me have it, John. Please. You insist. John. It's not a gun. It's a knife. I know. John. John, what are you doing? Never mind the John. Call me Jack. No, no. Hello, Lester. Canister. I didn't get you out of bed, did I? Yes, the police picked John up this morning. The guy? Oh, he's dead, all right. What oh, horrible, Les. Well, of course he's in a cell. All right, Les, I'm going in now and talk to John. Insane? Of course he must be. Right, Les, I'll meet you here at the jail. My time's up now, John. I'd better be going. Just one more thing, Callister. For some reason, I want you to understand. You see, Sir Guy was right. I did have to make an offering before the night was over. I didn't want for it to be him, Callister. But up there in that alley, I realized he was as determined as I. No, Canister, I still wonder who at that party was astute enough to send the police after me so quickly. Lester, perhaps. Police won't tell me, but I'll find out, Canister. And if it was Lester, he'll know I found out. But what difference can it make now? Oh, police haven't won yet, Canister. The gods won't let me down. They never have. Sir Guy was right about that, too. I am eternal. I have no age, you know. I never shall. Well, I'll be going. I'll miss you. Bye, John. Bye, Canister. Canister, I've died ten times over. Why, Les? He stayed today. The charge, you know. Oh, I still died ten times over. He suspected that you called the police. 
As long as he doesn't suspect you put me wise. Now, will you tell me how you found out about it? I was emptying the wastebasket after Tommy left last night for the party. Mm -hmm. I discovered a lot of astrological plotting in his handwriting. And that Englishman's words. Couldn't forget them. Tommy just told me the guards won't permit him to be executed. He thinks he really is Jack the Ripper. He's insane, Les. Oh, and I was afraid you'd say that. Well, what do you mean? Any doctor will tell you he is insane. I know they will. They'll also tell the jury. So? So, the law doesn't execute the insane. It allows them to live. You mean? Who knows, Canister? Who knows? <laughs> Comfortable thought, isn't it? Dr. Carmody may die for his crimes, but Jack the Ripper will live on. Oh, well, spirits are hard to kill, unless they come in a bottle. So with these uh, gentle thoughts, this is Peter Lorre closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Until next time, good night. Sleep tight. was Yours Truly, Jack the Ripper from the Mole Mystery Theater here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. I want to thank you, Scott, for uh, not only the suggestion, but the fact that you uh, t- listen all the time and you talk to your wife and teenage sons into listening. <laughs> that is fantastic. I just wish we'd have charged admission. <laughs> Somehow... <laughs> I wish this was turning into money. Uh, (laughs) um, So this technically wasn't the Mole Mystery Theater that we listened to. This was uh, the Armed Forces Radio version of this. They didn't re-record it. That's what I needed to know. The story in the center is just from Mole Mystery Theater. They cut out the narrator from Uh, Mole Mystery Theater. Jeffrey Barnes from Mole Mystery Theater. And added Peter Lorre. And added newly recorded intro and outro material from Peter Lorre. So... I really enjoyed Peter Laurie as a host. I always enjoy Peter Laurie, but, but yes. <laughs> right, of course. He's but perfect. I'm, exactly. And this is what I was going to ask. Why wasn't that tapped into more? I don't know. In I love radio. his intro. I love, hello, creeps. <laughs> 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 when we see each other, that should be <laughs> a little introduction. <laughs> hello, Eric, you creep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's interesting that someone didn't glom onto that idea as a host earlier. He was probably way too expensive to just uh, come probably, in and be a host. Yeah. He was probably donating his time because this arm. was aired just for servicemen. So. Right. Mole Mystery Theater went through a couple of different uh, versions and afterwards. Lots uh, of different lots versions. Lots of different versions of it after they lost the sponsorship of Mole Shaving Cream. Uh, how long did it run? Like several years yeah. on NBC, and then yeah. it moved to CBS, and I think there was actually some just barely connected version on ABC much later, but it had become something with a completely different title, something with Death Squad in it, Sir Jack Somebody and Death Squad. But yeah, it was all... Sir Jack Somebody and Death Squad? <laughs> what oh. it <laughs> Speaking of Sir... What did you just Sir say? Jack Somebody? <laughs> Uh, I didn't catch the name of the doctor in this, and so I wrote Dr. John something or other. I couldn't. <laughs> is it Thomason? I going It's Dr. Carmody. John. What? John Carmody. How did I get Thompson? Uh, I could not. <laughs> was the secretary Canister? Did I get it, that? It seemed like Canister. That's what I got out of it. Okay, here's my favorite name, though. Sir Guy. <laughs> that is like a name you say when you forget a guy's name. <laughs> hey, Sir Guy. <laughs> So this is written by Block, who has written a lot of uh, awesome stuff, Mm -hmm. including Psycho. I really enjoy the premise of this a lot. Is this something that has been delved into before, the idea that Jack the Ripper uh, was still alive and moved to the United States and continued to kill, or is this an original thought? Has this been tapped into before, or is this the first time? I don't know if if there's anything before this, but I know uh, Kolchak had an episode 
Mm-hmm. Well, the Night Stalker. Stalker? Yeah. Yeah. And when, well, nice. we mentioned in the intro, Star Trek, uh, that's the same plot from Wolf in the Fold. It's an a, right. a mortal Jack the Ripper character. So he revisits it for sure. And it may be right. some of uh, Block's influence. I know he was really influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. And his oh. earlier work was more in that vein. So you see this sort of crossing over with all the stuff of Jack the Ripper as a necromancer and, yeah. you know, sacrificing blood to gods to be immortal. So it has some of that kind of cosmic horror to it. But I was even surprised, which it's just math, but th- this is 50 years since Jack the Ripper was yeah. active. It seems much longer in my yeah. mind. Yeah, he, would, he would have been 83 years old or something, they said like that. And that he could be an adult child of a victim. Yes. Yeah, a temporal shock to me. <laughs> yeah, Jack the Ripper was still fresh in their minds mm-hmm. at the point that this aired. Also, he didn't need to be immortal because he would have only been 83. Yeah, one thing I liked, and it's an addition from Block's short story, is the secretary is the one who got... Jack the Ripper imprisoned. It's implied that he's going to get out, that it's not going to stop him. Because they can't kill him. I like the twist that it was a woman. Mm. All his victims had been women and that she Mm -hmm. was the one who nailed him in the end. Yeah, there's no secretary character all in Block's story. You read the story? I did. (laughs) It's a really good story. (laughs) My point, though, every week is how do you have time? The The whole time I was reading, it was like, they're going to make fun of me for reading. We're not making fun of you. It's like I'm I'm 10 years old. (laughs) Hey, nerd. Hey, reader McReader pants. (laughs) No. Listen, it's not that at all. We are the three busiest people on the planet. We can barely figure out how to get in here to record this and then we're like okay all right i got it now when did you do it an hour ago on the way here i wrote some stuff uh in blood on my pants that's my note because i didn't have any time and we have kids and we have all this how are we possibly going to get this podcast and i don't know you know what this week tim put a thing up so it's technical difficulties ah, we can't get it done and then you walk in here and you say yeah on top of everything else you guys I read this and like I could barely find the time to listen to this dumb thing for this dumb podcast <laughs> and here you are maybe that's what it is maybe I shouldn't say dumb thing well dumb maybe podcast. next time around we should do a podcast based on like an 800 page novel <laughs> Yes, that'll show him. That'll teach you. <laughs> it is a very short, short story. Or I didn't mean or, to read it, guys. It happened accidentally. Or, it popped up when I Googled, and it's really good. I read the first couple lines, and I just kept going. <laughs> and then never slept. No, it, it takes... How long does it take you to read a short Forever. story, Eric? Forever. It literally was 20 minutes. I, because I keep thinking about something else, and then i got to start over. <laughs> Why don't we do an old time radio podcast based on a show that's about the you know the greatest Super Bowls ever, and then I can go back and watch them all. <laughs> Find the episode. We'll I do st- it. I still wouldn't be have time. Uh, it, I'm just impressed by how you don't sleep, and I believe that you are some kind of immortal, crazy, weird being. Well, it's the blood of innocence, Eric. That's what helps me read short stories. <laughs> it's not just short stories. You're always coming in here like, yeah, well, you know, and then I saved a bunch of kids in Guatemala. And... <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> it's unbelievable what you do. I want to talk about the uh, actual episode. Here. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> All right. Tim, what did you think of it overall? Before I give an overall, I want to talk specifically about the length of the, this episode. Um, because this story seemed more compacted than many of the stories we... That usual full half hour or even longer stories that we mm-hmm. do. That I really appreciated the what I to me was tight, compacted storytelling. The pace kept moving, and it was interesting. And I felt like the story had sort of a a low bar to pass, and it passed it excellently. (laughs) (laughs) I think we've talked in this podcast before how I like things to move along (laughs) in storytelling and not dwell too long on things, especially if they're not going to (laughs) matter in the long run. And I really liked how this flowed. I liked how it went from the establishment uh, of him just quickly with the secretary in the lobby before he talks to doctor right and he's talking about 
astrological signs. It was really quick, and we got a sense of who he was and what's going on. Then she went in and gave a little more information to him. And the, so now we're moving. Now we know what's going on. And then we go to this, to that. Yeah. In the story, the first third of it is just a conversation in the office with the psychiatrist and Sir Guy. And what was, I think, very clever of the radio adaptation, pretty much as you mentioned, they take all that information and break it up into a bunch of little scenes. We get a little bit of that information between the secretary mm -hmm. and Sir Guy talking, and then the psychiatrist and Sir Guy, and then we go to the next day and he gets a phone call and they're having the conversation over the phone. So for audio, it just keeps it moving instead of a static scene that was six minutes of two guys just sitting in a room Correct. talking. So. It was really well done in that Enjoyed respect. That. On the other hand, uh, I felt like the mystery of it, of who is this Jack yeah. the figure, was, there all, wasn't a huge mystery of who it was going to be, I felt. We can leave that up to the individual, but I wasn't shocked. I knew it was coming, who mm -hmm. Jack the Ripper was going to be. I, mean, I still enjoyed yes. seeing mm -hmm. it unfold. I would have liked to have been, oh, it's that guy? Would have been great, but I think it was pretty obvious when you're only introduced to a few yeah. characters mm -hmm. that it limits what it's going to be. Well, I think it is interesting. I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the story. But because I think the adapters knew that it wasn't a huge surprise who Jack the Ripper was, I think that's why they added the coda. Because the story ends with just the reveal of Jack the Ripper and the psychiatrist stabbing Sir Guy. And yes. that's it. Oh, it wow. just ends. And so here they realize, no, there's more story here because maybe that's too predictable. Although I will say in the story, it's narrated by the psychiatrist, so there's more red herrings. Just you hear more of his voice sure. and you like him and he's the guy telling you the story. So I think the twist works better in the short story. So again, it goes back to the adapters being wise that in audio... And as they're stripping those story elements away, they need a different surprise. Some of the twist is, who was the one who told the police who Jack the Ripper was? That's your twist. It's, oh, it was the secretary. Yeah. I liked that coda quite a bit. Yeah. I did, too. Um, checking in if you guys know, has it ever been touched on before that the dates of the murders of Jack the Ripper are significant astrologically? Or is that something that is made up for this story? Everything has been made somehow significant about Jack the Ripper murders. So I, it's hard for me to know as not a Jack the Ripper expert whether something is new to this story. There's some connection between, and I'm sorry I don't have all the information, between the Zodiac Killer and Jack the Ripper that he had written something, a letter. Two letters were sent to the police allegedly from Jack the Ripper. Which remember. aren't proven, but right, yes. Which, which yeah. is where yours truly, Jack the Ripper, comes from? Yes. Okay, yes. And those letters, one of them was saying, I'm going to do this, uh, cut someone's ear off, and do this and that, and all these details. And I believe that the Zodiac Killer, which, forgive me, I can't remember what year that was, but contemporary times. Uh, 70s. 70s, I think. Yeah. But that he took that on. And they, I'm doing the murder that he promised. I think. An unfinished murder. <laughs> yes, something like that. That was one thing that struck me as I was listening to this as a really sort of mild, distant tangent. Because I've read so many stories and seen movies featuring Jack the Ripper and dealing with the, the victims of Jack the Ripper, that faint echo of, these were real people, and I feel a little bit bad mm -hmm. uh, about these entertaining stories uh, that aren't necessarily meant to be biographies, or this is not necessarily mm -hmm. meant to represent, this is what really happened to attach entertainment to those real things, even more than 100 years later. But I got over it. But <laughs> No, I know exactly what you're saying, is that we can get wrapped up in it as fiction and romanticize Jack the Ripper himself as some brilliant man who got away with these things and kind of yeah, uh, applauding things on some it. weird heightened level. Or even making him into a spiritual being like this mm -hmm. did. And, and then you stop and think, yeah, and then there are these women <laughs> and real people... Yeah. You got cornered by some weirdo in an alley. Yeah. 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 Well, we ruined that story. <laughs> ah, phew. Good. Um, Thanks, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the party scene a lot. Me too. The party scene makes me laugh because I, there's a word I want to use for the guy in the party scene, but I'm not going to. So I'm just going to use the word jerk. Mm -hmm. But what a jerk. <laughs> oh, okay. All right, everybody. Here we gather around. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. Mr. Looking for Jack the Ripper. We're going to turn the lights on. That guy, I was hoping he was the one that would get stabbed. And <laughs> but it was a fun 
setting and it had nice audio with everyone oh, they, talking in the background fantastically the tinkling produced. Piano. when the lights go off they said one minute it was almost actually a true minute mm -hmm. it wasn't it was like 30 seconds or a little less but it felt like an actual minute and that's that moment when you realize oh a minute is a long time but in the dark that uncomfortable giggle and then some mm -hmm. shuffling of feet and like <laughs> like a cough you know like it was really cool how they did that I, I, it was very real I like that scene a lot. Me too. Any other thoughts? I loved Peter Lorre coming back at the end because he had a Raymond-worthy joke at the end that I loved when he said, spirits are hard to kill unless they come in a bottle. <laughs> like, I, that's not a... Yeah. No, no, no. That's not a Raymond joke. That's a Dean Martin joke. It's true. <laughs> it's like if, if Raymond were Dean Martin. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm imagining Dean Martin posting the inner sanctum. Somebody put some oil on that door. It's going to keep us up all night. <laughs> We're going to get all your impressions out of you tonight. Yes, you are. <laughs> That's all of them. Isn't it? That's it. You're That's done. It. All right. Well, let's vote. Tim? Uh, I would stop short of saying it's a classic because, like I say, it's a, a tight, compact story that doesn't necessarily aspire to doing outstanding, amazing things. It's, it does a solid job of telling a suspenseful good story. Yeah. yeah it holds up. I, can I just say uh, exactly what Tim just said? Yeah. Like, stands the test of time, definitely. Just yeah. solidly well put together. Adapted intelligently. You can see what they were thinking about mm -hmm. and what they added and what mm -hmm. how they made it work for audios. Would have liked to solid. Have, would have liked to have been shocked by who was actually Jack the Ripper, but I don't know any better idea. <laughs> <laughs> I just love when things move. Don't screw around. Well done. Thank you, Scott. Yes, thank you Scott. so much. Uh, if you want to know more about us, please visit ghoulishdelights.com. Uh, you can find other episodes of this podcast there, and you can also learn information about live shows we do, because if you're in the Twin Cities area, you have a chance to see us perform live versions of classic old radio scripts. Yes, and you can also go to iTunes and write us a little review. Let us know what you think about the podcast. Maybe make suggestions or just communicate with us. <laughs> and sign it, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, we're going to be hearing one of Tim's choices. We're going to be hearing the show A Helping from the series The Clock. Until then... Look out! Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, direct from the bar... Dean Martin. Oh, well, spirits are hard to kill, unless they come in a bottle. <laughs>